morning. Good morning. Um, this is the Community Development Environment and Infrastructure Standing Committee. Uh, so I'm going to call this uh, meeting to order. I know we're missing uh, one of our committee members, uh, Councillor Isaac Sibley. So I think we'll start off with the uh, approval of the agenda. So moved. Okay, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Uh, first on the agenda, we have the minutes from June 28th. So moved. Okay. Discuss. So all those in favor, opposed, carried. And the minutes from, uh, oh, oh, sorry, one was for the community development, one was the sub ones from the environment and infrastructure for June 28th. Uh, so moved. Okay. And all those in favor, opposed, carried. So we are here today, and we'll start off with the Robert Porter Park. And we've got the uh, end deck here. Good morning. Um, so Robert Porter Park is in the Community Gardens Commons proposal. Uh, Robert Porter Park is situated in the Fairfield neighborhood near um, James Douglas School. So basically with this proposal we asked the group to come forward and look at going through a community garden policy initiatives to move it forward. And so the city typically approves it uh, use on parkland on a case-by-case -case basis following consultation with the affected community. In 2009, the group identified a main area for food and park staff worked with them and advised them on what type of consultation we expected them. Uh, the Fernwood Community Garden Group initiated outreach and consultation uh, with the original idea of going forward with, I guess, allotments, but over and through the consultation process and move towards a more commons garden permaculture approach. Uh, in February 2012, they submitted their final proposal to us. In May 2012, we did some soil testing. Uh, we found there was some higher levels of lead and relayed that back to the garden proponents and they uh, submitted a remediation plan on how they were gonna go forward and uh, mediate the, remediate the soils. So given all that, which is in your staff report, uh, we feel that it's in a future the viable project to move forward. It's about 500 square meters, which is slightly bigger than some of our other gardens, community gardens, fan field was about 300 square meters. We also have one on Work Street. Uh, the two red dots is the general location of it within the park space. The two red bubbles on Thurlow Street there. Um, some of the issues and opportunities we found, we found it to be consistent with the 2012 OCP. Uh, again, we found it comparable to other community gardens, common gardens we have in place in the city already. Uh, Robert Porter is the preferred size and layout in the neighborhood. Um, one of our objectives as we introduce new common gardens to each neighborhood, we'd like to see them close to community centers at first to show that viability and linkage. And we found that this site with discussions with the community fit that out all of those things that we look for to have a long-term successful garden. A um, couple of potential impacts is the current use in that area. There is quite a bit of dog off leash activity and there is natural areas to the north. We had significant discussions with our environmental technician and others and that also led us to the site that was chosen down on Thurlow Street. Essentially it's a walkthrough. They will be developing a permaculture type forest garden plan uh, with chestnuts, some desert king figs, Saskatoon berries, and, and then an understory of currants and uh, some berries again. They will be responsible for maintaining that whole area as well as the pathways. And I guess from this point on, our next step would be, if approved by council, would be to enter into a three-year renewable license agreement with this group. That's essentially uh, the Fairfield Community Garden. Any questions? Any questions first? Where does the light come from? Uh, we're unsure. Uh, there was, if you look at the old photos in that area, there's stone steps and stuff, so it could be from an old house that was in that area. So, could have been even the fill they brought in when they that house up. 
Um, the, the trees you're planting are fairly substantial, so the, I think you were talking about putting a, a foot or so of topsoil on these. These trees are obviously going to be have root systems. Do they do they carry the lead into the root or not? Uh, I'm not aware. Uh, we went through. We relied on environmental technicians uh, with the uh, MOE as well for advice, and the actual levels of lead aren't really that high. Of concern. They're just a little bit high for agriculture land. So, in the proposal, one of the mitigation remediation techniques is to dig out a fairly sizable soil pit for the trees and replace it with new soils. Um, it's a good question. Uh, do you know any more information on it? Uh, I spoke with the regional agrologist, um, Rob Klein, with the Ministry of Agriculture, and his comment was is that the amount of uptake from plants is, with lead is actually relatively limited. limited. Um, so, a process of lining and Removing some of the very topsoil would, would assist in, in reducing that uptake to a point that he felt comfortable that he would be uh, fine to move forward with this. Now, when you talk about removing soil, obviously for those Chinese chestnuts, I mean, that root ball would be enormous. You're not going to, you can't dig out that much, can you? I mean, they want to reach its maturity. No, that's part of the liming remediation okay. and other soil remediation. So, in, well, a few years with the change in the pH balance and uh, potential uptake for hazards, so minimal, there's not a concern there. So this this is not presenting the same way. The community garden is quite different from the rocking garden. So this is presenting will will present sort of with the natural area almost, won't it? Yeah. Uh, the permaculture type look will present a little bit more like a natural area. It'll have a, a tree canopy and then down lower on you'll have a, a herb layer and a berry or mixing, mixing in layer. So your shrub layer will also be in there. So it will essentially look like a little forest natural area as you walk through. But it will need some maintenance to keep out of invasive plants and stuff. Like exactly. That. And, and that will be provided by the community garden. Maintenance and at the beginning of the program, it takes care of So what, <clears throat> I have a few questions. So exactly what Councilor Young said, this is not like a community garden that I had. Uh, I've seen in other neighborhoods. So um, will there be eventually looking into plantings of like lettuce and, or is this uh, what they're envisioning? Yeah, this is more permaculture. It's similar to what Banfield Park is too, and somewhat Work Street Garden is more. Uh, it's more organic and grows and continues to produce, and the way that the plants interact with each other, the, the nitrogen mixing and stuff. So it's more. Uh, it's a different approach than a yearly, annual, or biannual planting of a food garden. This is more a sustainable approach where the food continues to produce with a little less maintenance than a. And, and who? Is there any guidelines of who the fruit belongs to? Or the uh, well, the guidelines being a community garden, they belong to the community, so it's a first come, first harvest type situation. Um, we find in most of our community gardens around the city, we actually find people to come pick them a little more, so we haven't had that issue if they're not being enough produce or stuff to harvest, because people tend to be a little hesitant. So it's worked well in, in other parts of the city. I, I looked at, uh, so from, from the report, and they put it in the report, uh, there was some indication that, of course, there is some op uh, opposition to it. Mm -hmm. And I went through my emails last night to find some of the letters of uh, opposition that, uh, emails I received. And I think part of the comments uh, was, Sorry. Is, it, is it working okay, Ms. Gibbs? I think uh, Mr. Schaefer will help you with it. Um, I think. So one of the things that people are saying is that it might impede on their uh, dog off leash. So my understanding is, is this is not an off leash area for dogs, so they really should get used to off leash. Uh, my the second comment that we get is that uh, the feeling that a public space that can be used by many is now going to be uh, a space that's going to be only benefiting some. But from my understanding, because they're not allotment gardens, it is benefiting anyone that's walking through and wanting to pick a berry. So it, it, it's very different than a garden where you have your own plot, and this is sort of my 
my group, my class space. space. Yeah. yeah, it's very different than that. For sure, they're establishing a trail network and it's open to the public to wander through at any yeah. time. And my third question is, one of the letters uh, we did receive was from the Gary Oak Ecosystem Recovery Team. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure whether um, you were able to go and show them the plan and the location and, and whether they feel comfortable with uh, with the with the location. I think part of it was that it may make people move over more to the Gary Oak uh, area and, and Trampo and that area a little bit more. But I know there was talk about the bluebirds, which you uh, mentioned in the report. Mm -hmm. But I just was wondering whether you've had any discussions with them at all. Uh, we had discussions early on through our environmental technician, and there was definitely some concerns there. And at the end. We were advised through our environmental technician that the area is already very heavily trampled with the school use and stuff on the rocks. And the bluebirds have yet to show up. They do still like the meadow. And they're able to flight path into the boxes from the meadow, which is somewhat maintained by the width of this. And still allowing that if they were to show up in that area. So it's a question of distance and a little bit, you know, we're not too sure on their exact habitat patterns. Boxes, but as far as the Gary Oak Meadow goes, it's that's no impact on that. If, if anything, it'll reduce the traffic in there because we'll have another natural area for people to visit. Yeah, they've been just a little vague about the fencing. Um, group plans on establishing physical boundaries, um, young plantings and perennials, and the young, they are planning on planting annuals during the first few years which will obviously be pretty attractive to deer. Um, later on, they, s they seem to indicate that um, the sort of um, the permaculture will be less attractive to deer, but they say boundaries will be developed in a creative way, et cetera. What, what does that really mean? Can I speak to that? Yeah, we're not sure. Uh, with the design, we've approved the design that you see up there. So I think their boundaries, quite creative, would be the lower shrub boundary to basically try and keep dogs from being able to infiltrate into there. So that's a good question when we look at finding finer details. Well, the fact is, if they want to keep all deer out, they're going to need an eight foot chain link fence or a six foot solid board fence. They talk about maintaining view corridors and so forth. I mean, I, I Fencing isn't enough, wasn't proposed in this. So we don't foresee any foot fence. They're aware of the deer issues. And as all community gardens are, we be reluctant to give anybody a foot fence around to protect their community. The allotment gardens in Fernwood look like a low security prison. Yeah, they're, up, they're not on park land. No, but it, so it, these these people are aware that it's going to look a little more like the community garden in terms of sort of un, unfenced. Yes, they're very aware of that. Okay. It, it's maybe worth noting that there, it, this is about the second or third uh, version of their proposal, and their original proposal did include allotment gardens as, as part of the proposal. And I think there was a lot of pushback from the community around private use of, of park space. So I think this is a, a, this is about the third iteration of the proposal that's really in a response to the community saying, hey, this is a community asset and we should keep it as a community asset as, a, as opposed to something that would be a more traditional allotment garden approach. So just to finish on the fencing, uh, there is a possibility of some of the younger plants that are put in that individual it's a fence and until they get established. Okay. Sort of within the boundary that have the individual small fence. Like a netting or Some of the other experiences at the community gardens, uh, there needs, you know, as we go down the road, there's a, the community council says, you know, we need a, uh, some kind of a storage area for equipment, um, or we need more lighting because of some kind of vandalism, or uh, we need access to washrooms. Uh, I think, I guess, being close to the school and the community center, 
have both, all those things be provided by That's our hope. We don't, we don't intend on providing any of those things or seen it in our proposal. So we're basing it on them not being on site and using that. So that's kind of where parks thinking is coming from as new communities get involved. We think around their community centers the easiest for them. Really, if you can't make it work there, I think the struggle to make it work in other parts of the city because they won't have any of those support services, our facilities. Another thing about the community center in a JSON is you have a lot of traffic back and forth to them. So people will naturally gain curiosity and maybe join the group or just through their daily travels and passing through it rather than being in a park where only a couple people in the neighborhood pass by once in a while. So it's at the forefront. It has to look and be successful and we have a three year license and if it doesn't meet Besides the initial capital uh, dollars, is what, what would kind of operating dollars for, for the city? Is there anything there? Uh, the only thing it does would be to benefit us if we were dropping off mulch instead of bringing it back. We don't foresee any operating dollars outside of the initial water hookups that we provide. So that's the idea, is they're supposed to be self sufficient. We do support gardens with chip drop off or we can always drop off once in a while but it's usually either access that we're selling off or you have to pay to get trucked away or it's on the current routes in the fall so instead of dropping it off back at the yard we can just drop it off at the garden locations so it actually benefits slightly This is one of those things that um, will likely come back as an item simply to request signature on the uh, deal that uh, the license agreement that you're providing staff with the uh, the authority to negotiate. So it's, it's quite likely that you'll see it again once it's completed. Okay. Um, if there's anything else, so we'll have a question. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And the next thing on the agenda is the Pioneer Square Management Plan. Yeah, I can just jump in at the, the start on the on this one. So, uh, Pioneer Park's one of our uh, our oldest parks in the city. It's uh, certainly one of our most challenging sites as well. It's uh, uh, it has infrastructure in it that's over 120 years old and. Uh, um, I think it's challenging from kind of a conflicting use point of view. It's probably the, you know, one of the parks that we get the most uh, complaints, concerns from 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 residents. It's used uh, for a whole bunch of conflicting uses, uh, all the way from memorials to uh, uh, homeless uses to uh, uh, community gatherings in the park and lots of. Uh, um, well, an emerging community r around it as well of, of residents who uh, have an eye on the park on a daily basis, and I, you know, I just wanted to um, remind you that uh, we we typically use the management plan or the park management plan process to have conversations with the community about what does the future of this park look like and. Uh, uh, really provide that certainty for the community about uh, you know this is what you can expect from this park for the next 20 25 years in terms of uh, what how parks is going to manage how the city's going to manage this property so we think it's a really good tool to have that conversation with the community and uh, the process has been a couple years in the in the works the pioneer park is our 2012 management plan project and uh, um, 
we've completed uh, that kind of almost two years worth of discussion with, with the community and presenting that information to you. And so I'll turn that over to Dr. Lee in terms of presenting it. But uh, yeah, I guess I would just leave by saying, you know, I think, I think the management plan process has been very successful for us. You will have, you'll remember Cecilia Ravine from last year and Summit Park from the year before and uh, Fisherman's Wharf, which, uh, you know, we just opened from the year previous to that. So, so we think it's been a good tool in terms of, uh, you know, figuring out how, how do we more effectively manage, manage these parks going forward. If the yep. sound isn't entirely clear, you, you might need to move closer to hear it because the uh, it's coming straight out of the computer speakers. What? Yeah. Yeah. Climbing next corner is a small rectangular park located adjacent to Christ Church Cathedral. It is bounded by Quadra Street to the west, Rockland Avenue to the south, Near Street to the north, and multifamily housing to the east. It's officially in the Fairfield neighborhood also serves Harris Green downtown. Also known as the Old Burying Ground, it served as the city cemetery from 1855 to 1873. It contains some of the province's oldest carved headstones and embodies a collective memory of British Columbia's colonial era. Many of the province's earliest and most prominent settlers are interred here. In 1908, the majority of the headstones were relocated to the eastern edge of the grounds. As a result, visitors are often surprised to learn that there are over 1,300 people interred at the site. Over the years, there has been continuing decay of the monuments due to weathering as well as vandalism. Recognizing the importance of preserving the monuments, beginning in the 1980s and into the 90s, stones were removed from the site and placed into storage. The park is also home to several significant military memorials, providing strong symbolic and memorial value to the military associations that erected them. Today, Pioneer Square functions as one of the only urban green spaces in downtown Victoria. It is often used by area office workers as a lunch spot during the warmer months or by those just seeking a place to sit and rest and read. Significant mature trees grace the site to provide welcome shade on a hot summer day. The challenge and the opportunity of devising a management plan for Pioneer Square is in balancing the cultural historical landscape, the commemorative aspects of the park, with the community use as green space. So I'll put on some motion soon after that, but just a little introduction <laughs> to remind you of what the square, the square is and a little walk through.
So we considered a variety of documents, including a 1991 Old Cemetery Society proposal existing and the draft, the new official community plan draft uh, at the start of the project, uh, Heritage Strategic Plan, the City's Greenways Plan, Cathedral Hill Precinct, and the City of Victoria Park Survey uh, Plan and the Downtown Core Area Plan as well. Uh, we did hold two rounds of public consultation. Both were well attended. I'll speak to those on the, on the next slide. Um, but just the last point, we did review the plan with the Heritage Advisory Committee at their June 12, 2012 meeting, and they recommended it for approval. Um, so we had the first round of public consultation was in the summer of 2011, and uh, we had an open house in June, as well as there was a series of three info booths uh, set up in either the park or at the Y. Um, the display panels and the survey were available for two weeks. We received over 330 um, completed surveys. Um, so some of the key findings, just a uh, good portion of the people who attend the park and live nearby, and the top three reasons were for leisure, commuting through the park, using those diagonal pathways to connect as well as viewing the tombstones and taking in sort of the history of the site. There was a strong interest in preserving the tombstones as well as in providing greater inter interpretation of the historical elements and then just generally improved general maintenance. Uh, many also commented that they felt unsafe in the square at night but didn't, uh, didn't note a uh, feeling of uh, being unsafe during the day. Um, after that, we sort of compiled all that information and prepared a draft plan um, which we took back out to the public uh, in winter of 2012, basically to ask the question, did we get it right? Um, and at that time, 90%. So again, uh, we had the survey and display panels were available for two weeks as well um, as the open house. And so 90% of the respondents to that, I think we had less, about 80, 85 respondents, which is relatively typical. Um, the majority indicated their support and provided uh, strong support for all of the recommendations recommendations identified in the plan. As part of the management plan process, we had a statement of significance prepared, um, which identified the heritage values and some of the character defining elements. Um, they're listed there, I won't go through them in detail, but some of the significant ones are it has its continued use as a designed landscape since 1855, both as a cemetery as well as a park space. Um, and sort of that associated use as, as a park for reflection and relaxation. And also the, the monuments and memorials um, that are located in, in the site. The vision um, identified for the site um, is in intending to balance that cemetery versus park um, aspect of the site. Um, so preserving and enhancing the historical value while maintaining park space that suits the needs of the community. Um, recognizing the square as a historic burial ground and, and allowing and visiting, providing that interpretive opportunity to share the stories of the past. Um, recognizing that the role of the commemorative monuments that are existing in the space and that they have a continued role there and, and along with that um, continuous use of the space um, as green space um, near downtown. So with the public consultation and the vision in, in mind, we were able to identify some management themes to base the management plan around. Um, preserving the historical cultural landscape and looking at the community use as green space were some of the ones that definitely moved to the top. We'll go over all the management themes listed there in detail, which really is a foundation of the recommendations. First one, preserving historical cultural landscapes. So objectives were to recognize Pioneer Square as an important historic site and really maintain and preserve the mon monuments that are representative of the historic cemetery and commemorative aspect of the site. It really comes down to, uh, in Canada, this part of Canada has standards and guidelines for the conservation of historic places in Canada. So a lot of the discussions throughout the management plan development were based on the recommendations of this guiding document, which we use and is adopted through the heritage planning process. And of course, as Lee mentioned earlier, the statement of, of significance was another key guiding document for all of uh, the people on the advisory committee. 
It was also decided and the importance of this site that we'd like to seek heritage municipal designation similar to that of uh, Beacon Hill Park and Ross Bay, uh, acknowledging that it's a very culturally significant site to the residents of the city of Victoria. And with that designation, uh, there is uh, another process added on, but we have determined there are some exclusions through that process that will allow it where not everything has to come before council for decisions made on the Pioneer Square site. Another thing we looked at was the preservation of the stone monuments. Uh, we felt it was important if we were going to recommend bringing the stone monuments back and maintaining the ones there was to hire uh, well, a consultant to outline how we can preserve these monuments. They are Many of them are sandstone and they don't have as long as life as the new monuments you see as granite and stuff. So we looked at the stone conservation report to guide us on future recommendations if it was even feasible. And they felt that uh, cleaning the water repellents were feasible options, mortar bases, and even strengthening the some of the stones to uh, keep them in place as well as prevent some of the vandalism that's happened. We're all achievable within the context of the standard guidelines and the context of maintaining the site. Another important aspect is there's the preservation of oops, preservation of the tombstone arrangements. Um, if you can imagine, this site was covered in tombstones at one point and then in the early 1900s, as Council Young has alluded to, uh, there was a change to make it the park space and the, the director of parks did lose his job over it. But one thing that did come out of it was this eastern grouping. Um, we feel that uh, the cost and changes associated with moving this eastern grouping to scatter the tombstones throughout the site would be prohibit prohibitive and we might do more damage than we do and will be good. But we also have a number of tombstones that were moved to storage. We look to uh, the community uh, and we did some community outreach including the museum and stuff and asked them you know, do you guys want samples of these tombstones? And if so, we need to determine what we're going to do with them because we didn't feel it was appropriate to leave them in storage for the remainder of their life. Uh, looking back again to the standards guidelines, we determined that it would probably be best to return them to site and potentially keep one or two fine, fine samples only in case the museum changed their mind and uh, decided they wanted to keep them for their... So, we looked at the northeast corner, or the northwest of the site, which is off of Broughton Street, to be where we'd establish another tombstone arrangement. Uh, this helps identify the park from the downtown corridor looking down Broughton Street, and it helps ma for maintenance and longevity. It helps establish an area that doesn't have a lot of tombstones in it already, so we feel it'll, it'll help establish the whole park site as as its former space with obviously fewer tombstones from originally there 100 plus years ago. So the blue area outlined in blue is where we'd see this new grouping. Uh, if you recall back to the video, those tombstones in storage would be what we'd be replacing there using the stone conservation techniques to ensure they're, they're sustainable. It's a little heavy on this button. Um, the future commemorative monuments. There's a lot of commemorative monuments in it in the square and most of them are war based and some of them keep we feel that with the memorials they should continue to be relevant to the site be consistent with the aesthetic value of the square and be designed for longevity and minimal maintenance the management plan does outline some of those guidelines to consider when looking at any future primitive monuments to the site um, another thing, they're mostly war related now, but we also feel it might be appropriate if they re relate to past burials. What we noted as we actually moved through this process and including some earlier work by the Vic PD is education was lacking around this site. And once we reached out to the community and informed them on the prevalence of this site in the community and its past uses, we found that people started to even start respecting the site a little more. So we're hoping that beyond that, there's also a component for interpretation and learning about those city's pioneers. So we feel a 
sharing the cultural knowledge through both personal and non personal interpretation is important. Um, there's a few ways that we've outlined an interpretive plan and includes a memorial feature, providing the names of the original 1300 uh, to be looked at in the future, and stone specific signage for some of the larger monuments, especially if they have an interesting story behind them. So some of the interpretive elements can not only be about the site, but about the individuals. So we think that's important. And if it's not, if it's just general, we'd like to keep it outside of the boundaries, so along the sidewalks and basically the perimeter of the site looking to quiet history. Another major focal point that rose to the top of our discussions was community use. And so we decided it was important to identify on-site improvements to encourage broader community use in this space, recognizing that it is one of our only downtown or very close to downtown green spaces, and also the relationship to the church. Identifying improvements to create a safer, more inviting space and build relationships, relationships with groups interested in using this square. So when we reviewed the community use, we found that the park entrances and pathways seemed to work for the most part on what people's objectives were. And we feel that you know, there are some maintenance items that can be taken care of and looking at a two meter width as a minimum width. Right now they range between 1.5 and places up to 2.8 three meters. And we also found that there was a lot of trees in the area as well. Uh, that need to be looked at. So we have 74 trees throughout this square, and yeah, we yeah, sorry, had an arborist develop a tree management plan developed throughout the planning process. It looked at about 13 trees were to be removed either because they're declining in health or invasive species. Those would be replaced if, if deemed appropriate. Uh, the, the coverage on that square was already reaching its maximum capacity for canopy. Some of the questions throughout the survey process and trying to determine the appropriate uses included dog man management, uh, whether it was appropriate to allow dogs on pathways or not. The feedback we got from the public is that we shouldn't consider any changes to the current bylaw that restricts, well, restricts, eliminates dogs from the park space. Uh, furnishing should be updated, keeping in the context of the use of the square, looking back to its historic context as well of being a cemetery and a, and a appropriate furnishings uh, that reflect the cemetery character. Uh, currently, if you look here, this is one of the lighting furnishings. It doesn't really reflect the historic value of this part. And we looked at fencing a number of different options. Uh, if you think about cemeteries in the past, they often have perimeter fences or other type of fencing. Uh, we brought all those ideas forward to the community and from the feedback we received from the community and our group, the advisory group, we, we felt that the only fencing should be limited to just small wrought iron fencing around some of the significant monuments as necessary to protect them. <clears throat> One of the questions that came up throughout was the importance of Rockland Avenue and maintaining it as a transportation thoroughfare for vehicles. It is on the Greenways plan, and it should be clear that on the Greenways plan, it's identified as a people priority Greenway. Uh, which means it is identified to be shared with vehicles as opposed to a people-only greenway, which would mean no sharing with vehicles. Uh, we had engineering do a number of modeling studies, and we actually found that some of the rates of pedestrian and bike use were, it was around 30% of the transportation mode share, which is some of the higher rates, if not the highest rate, that they've seen in the city. Uh, so we looked at closing a portion of Rockland, fronting the square, and using it as a multi-use pathway with additional grass and passive space. Obviously, the adjacent neighbors being the cathedral and the school, uh, we talked to them extensively, and both were very supportive of this plan. They felt it meets their longer-term objectives for the whole site in general. So uh, one of the questions in this recommendations is for that closure on a trial potentially trial basis without future consultation, uh, just using some reversible uh, mechanism and seeing what we hear from the public. Uh, council would like to direct us to do some consultation on that closure. If they feel it's within the recommendations of the plan, we'd be happy to discuss that. 
So some of the other items uh, in the plan are developing a feasible operations plan for the management of the square that looked at uh, our mowing or implementation, irrigation of the flower bed around the center path, and replacing some of the existing gravel surfaces in the eastern grouping just to clean it up with turf and then allowing uh, the bases of the tombstones to be wider with mowing strips. We just felt it would be a cleaner and more representative site of what a cemetery should look like. And it would also a little bit help to eliminate the eastern grouping being such a prominent, it looks like it was just gathered there and thrown in there type site. And we don't see a large increase, increase in operational dollars to continue to maintain this site. And another one was to continue the advisory group to help ensure the implementation of this plan is fitting with the square's heritage. I think it's important in this case to keep the advisory group involved. Um, a lot of good recommendations came forward and we also see it as a conduit to the community for both interpretation and reach out to help with uh, budget funding for some of the improvements to the tombstones in the future. Which brings us to our overall budget. We looked at the Heritage Tombstones improvements, which is the major portion of this budget, uh, looking at 405,000. We receive, we see this uh, as partnership funding in the future and looking for opportunities for grants and partnerships with individual families, as well as the community use improvements, which sit around 225,000. And as you noted, throughout, there's not a major change to the use of the park, so a lot of this is really just maintenance that's probably overdue in that park and bringing some of the furnishings in line with what a cemetery or burial ground site should look like with the community use perspective. And then identifying the interpretive plan brings us to looking at 700,000 over the next few years. Uh, we're not uh, we're not requesting additional capital monies. We feel this can be implemented through our management plan implementation budget that council has approved in previous years, assuming it remains within the same range. Our tar target for implementation, implementation is obviously contingent on council approval of capital budgets, and we're looking at getting into a little bit of design work in the remainder of 2012, and a fair bit of construction, rehabilitation of tombstones in 2013, 2014 as well as some of the improvements to the pathways because they have a lot of mall rooting coming up from the surrounding trees. And that pretty much concludes our presentation and we'd like to open it to questions. Uh, several questions, but I'll start off with Councilor Young. Did you want to go first? Yes. Um, well, yeah, I'm certainly um, supportive of this. Um, As, as I as I suggested earlier, I, we were back in 1908. Um, the city was very uh, very precipitate, I think, in, in gathering up all those tombstones and moving them. <laughs> I I really I, I know that the process we have now with public input does tend to take a long time and obviously costs some money, but I I think it is. Uh, I think it is a good, a good process. When when I first came on council, the um, the parks director would get his budget allocation and then spend it uh, according to plans that weren't vetted far less by the community. The council didn't even see them. I, I was the parks, uh, the councillor responsible for parks, if you like, and um, I found hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent on projects that I did not think um, were were necessary uh, or desirable. I, I thought they, they were un aesthetically unpleasing. Um, there was one project that uh, where a whole bunch of money was spent and it had to be reversed because uh, it offended the sensibilities of the local First Nations community. It was a bridge to one of the, uh, 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 an island that had been used as a grave site. So I, 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 I do applaud the, um, the process, and I, and, uh, I, I think, and, and I'm supportive of this. I am, um, 
a lot of people are not aware of the history of the park. I, I know up to up until a few years ago, and I don't know if it's still true, you could actually see along the Quadra Street side when the sun was setting, you could actually see the depressions of the of the graves. And I don't know if they're still there a century later, but I mean, if, if the um, the use as a as a burying ground was, was very apparent. Um, I, I do I do support the um, the Rockland closure. Uh, clearly, uh, th that is um, a, a very regular bicycle route. A lot of people come uh, south on Quadra and turn left onto Rockland. It's just a just a very standard route for bicyclists that's um, heavily used, and and I think even even a provision for that left turn onto the, the closed road would be a, a good thing in terms of our bicycling infrastructure. Um, obviously in the future, uh, there will be some more significant cost to that as we narrow the road and, and um, reinstalled landscaping and so forth. Uh, but um, I, I think that that is a good thing to start with. Um, obviously I am a little concerned about uh, about the costs for the tombstone restoration. Um, and I notice you, you talk about partnership funding. Um, one possible partnership is obviously descendants of the owners of the tombstones. I don't know, if, has there been any um, exploration of that? Is that feasible at all? I, I, just, I just don't know. And where, where might the money come from for that component of the plan? So some of the some of our more prevalent tombstones in there, we see some of that money coming out of our capital budgets. Uh, we do have a list uh, that the cathedral kept of family names. And we have we find that maybe that memorial will bring more some more people up, but we have talked to a couple families who have expressed interest in moving forward with uh, rehabilitating or preserving their family tombstone. We haven't gotten into the details of costs or what they're willing to. conversations go. So we think just throughout the process when those people came forward, I think if we actually did a little bit more investigation once this is approved, if it's approved, we can find we think there might be some more opportunities. I uh, don't know if they're going to be a significant contribution to those costs. So, uh, Steve, do you have Steve Barber, do you have a heritage planner also to maybe speak to some of the grant courses that are any opportunities that might be available? Well, in the past, we would have been able to access provincial government funding through the BC Heritage Trust. And now that is essentially in place now with what's called the Heritage Legacy Fund. Um, they do have some funding that we could potentially be eligible for, but it would be very limited in the amount compared to the cost that it's required. Um, grants that come through there are roughly between $10,000 and $25,000. So, but we would technically be eligible to provide that fund. Other than Well, obviously, um, thank you. My um, my highest priority would be preserving tombstones that are actually deterior deteriorating now. The ones that we have in storage presumably are are um, not deteriorating further, um, and while it would be desirable to replace them on the site, I I would see that as a lower priority in terms of our spending. If things are out there now and actively um, getting worse, then, then I, I can certainly see that that should be a focus for spending. Now, the one the one um, aspect that I have a uh, concern about is the proposal for heritage um, municipal heritage designation. I, I noticed that you you're not recommending provincial designation. Uh, basically, I think the federal designation you say doesn't really mean a lot. I, I, I'm just, it's, it's, it's basically, a municipal designation is really just saying, we know better than future councils, <laughs> and we want to we wanna get this designation so that they can't do, do something without uh, going through another process, and, and uh, it, just, it, just, it just seems to me that it's, that it's a lot of we, we've discussed this in the, con in the context of 
getting a parks designation for all our parks. And basically, the reaction we've had is, yeah, you can do a lot of work. You can prepare all the statements. You can go to the public hearings. And in the end, the, the only impact is that a future council, in wanting to do something, would have to go through a public process, which we're saying we would do it, but those future people, they wouldn't do it because they don't care what the public thinks or something. So I, I, I do have a little difficulty with us going through that process with all the, with all the expense and staff time, really, for, for an asset that is already in public hands and, and um, where, the, where the degree of protection is not, is, in my view, not going to be added to a lot. It's, it's quite different from for a private property where there is a, an actual impact. Anyway, that's my comment. Thank you. Uh, for, first thing, for me, I just want to commend staff. I thought it was a very thorough uh, report to dealt with every aspect, whether it was, uh, with, you know, anything from the arbors for the trees to the heritage aspects of the statement of significance. So I really appreciated the thoroughness of the report. Um, just a couple questions that sort of, in reading the report, that sort of uh, came to my mind. And I just started at the beginning. When you, I looked at the um, advisory committee, it was just a question. In the video, and as well as uh, several statements from staff, you mentioned downtown or close to downtown, or that uh, the people that, that came and filled out the surveys said they lived within five minutes of the park, which probably could have meant that they were residents of downtown. And I, I noticed on your advisory committee, I don't think uh, anyone from the Downtown Business Association uh, is listed as, as being on the committee. And I noticed you say the Downtown Business Association but not the Downtown Res Association. So I would mind you some comments on whether they were invited or? Yeah, uh, thinking back three, four years ago, they were invited and they declined. They actually pointed us to the Downtown Business Association. And, uh, and then they went to a representative. We also had the, the Strata guy, the Jason Turbo's a Strata sitting on to represent, we hope, some more of the Okay. I, I think uh, if this is supported, it might be one of my recommendations to make sure the report does go, get to the resident association so they can at least set up, have a look at it and make it, um, be made aware and make any comments. Uh, I think the resident association in the downtown has sort of changed and grown through the years and so I think maybe they have been asked today if it might have changed. Um, the, uh, I understand uh, the comments about perimeter fencing, uh, but I guess uh, my, my question is, or maybe just a comment, I've seen the effects, the positive effects of some perimeter fencing around uh, Bridge Park. And so uh, I, I think when I think of fencing, I think of all different types of fencing, and, and there are many that I would not support, but I think there's uh, maybe in the future, maybe advantageous to look at some perimeter fencing uh, that is, minimal and, and you know, respects uh, the, the, the heritage, the historic uh, nature of it. Uh, but once again, I just uh, recognize uh, a lot of the impact, uh, positive impact at Bridge Park. Uh, of course, I can't go on without mentioning dogs. <laughs> so, um, but I do, you know, I was in the Dogs and Parks uh, Committee and, and um, I understand the uh, reasoning uh, for not having dogs even on leash on there and I can support that. Although I know that uh, cemeteries, I think, are moving a little bit away from that. I know I'm on the, uh, 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 what do you call it, the Royal Oak uh, Cemetery, um, uh, the council liaison for that. And they do have do allow dogs, and they actually have uh, poop bags on, on at the cemetery. So I think we're re recognizing that uh, people uh, either do walk their dogs or, or sometimes will, will uh, visit family members. But being this is a heritage one, I can you know, definitely support that uh, no dogs be allowed. To, for us to continue that. Uh, my other thing was um, security, and you know, the, I know we have bylaws, but uh, the, our, our something that says the park cannot be used at during certain hours. But I guess the difficulty is uh, the enforcement of it, and of course, um, you know, with our uh, using the police for those to, to, to monitor it is difficult. Was there any discussions of? any looking at security for the park or whether it's like as like we have in you know, 
square or a security that would drive around? I just want to know whether that's even discussed. Uh, Sort of discussions around patrols. We didn't go into too much depth. We talked to the Vic PD a bit because they were on our advisory committee, and they had declining responses there. So they felt that they were proactive a couple of years before we started the plan. And we looked to add additional lighting, as outlined in the report, also would increase some of the security features. Yeah, we didn't really get into discussing patrols. We felt it was sort of outside the range of what we can maybe afford at this point for. And it may be something in the future after the changes are made. Exactly. Uh, it's a good comment, though, and something we can look into in the future. And uh, I, I actually can support um, municipal designation. I, I, I think it's just a, a tool for, for uh, protection and to alert whether a future council or, or the public uh, that we need to be aware of uh, the heritage significance of the site. Uh, one of the questions is, when I look at the provincial or federal designation, uh, I was uh, involved with some of the restoration of the Chinese cemetery at Harley Point. And in my understanding, I think some of the funding for restoration came from other levels of government. Now, things may have changed since then, and those pockets of money may not be available. But I, although we look, I think you comment about uh, some of the um, cons of, of trying to see provincial or federal designation. Is there any benefits financially of, of designating? Is there any money that might flow by having a provincial or federal? I think you mentioned provincially, but I, I think you're federally better to do some funding. Have you heard a teacher the name of some family and seen whether you qualify for a federal or national designation? The amount of funding in those programs, of course, varies over time. So the two that I definitely, uh, I do support the, um, the recommendations and the designation and the, uh, the, the Rockland uh, closure, I think as you said, at a trial uh, basis. Yeah, I, think that, uh, I think from the report and uh, the use of it, I think it does warrant um, moving towards that. And I'm really appreciative that you're going to continue to work with the advisory committee, as I said. Uh, I really appreciate the heritage aspects and, and uh, reports from the different different groups like the Cemetery Society and, uh, all, and uh, all the others. Um, I don't think that, oh, and in a personal uh, question is, uh, I noted uh, in the report that there were some Chinese that were buried there. And I do recommend, I think there was comments that you wanted to list the names of the uh, 1,300 people that had been buried there. And that was uh, of interest in because uh, I, I don't know if you're aware, but I do tours of the Chinese cemetery, and one of the things that was found is that when uh, they were looking at the Ross Bay cemeteries of the Chinese that were were buried there, uh, names were not listed. They were listed as uh, Chinaman number one, Chinaman number two, and so I think the sensitivity. If, I don't know what the names are for the uh, Pioneer Square, uh, or sorry, for the uh, for this one, and whether names were listed. And I think if if you are going that route. Uh, if you can encounter some some of uh, the Chinese community, it might be advantageous to uh, approach the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association and what might be a uh, respectful way to acknowledge. Sorry. So those are my comments. So any other comments or other questions here? So uh, I know that the, the, there's one uh, full recommendations since the Pioneer Square Management Plan we approved as presented, and I know throughout the report there are uh, individual recommendations, and I don't know whether there's anything you need to pull out of that, and you're happy to well, use them as a whole. Well, I'll, I'll comment on the issues when it comes to council, but I'm prepared to send it on the council. Okay. All right, so I think I heard you say you moved it for talking, and uh, no other discussion. So, yes, Madam Chair, if I may, the, the question I would have for this committee is, would you like a presentation done at GPC of this management plan uh, for the benefit of other counselors to uh, 
get some of the insights, or would you just like this committee to send it directly to, to council? Um, oh, oh, it, well, I, I think a presentation would be worthwhile. I think it should, uh, obviously, it's, it's short. Uh, I think it also, though, should focus particularly on the budget issues and the timing of spending. I noticed that you and the availability of funds, because that's clearly going to be one of the primary interests of council. Um, I noticed that I know, I know that you've suggested that tombstone restoration aspects um, can be spread out, whereas there's a bunch of construction that we want to be all in one, in one uh, go. So I think you should sort of try to separate Present a sort of a budget, a budget plan. So the motion that's on the table at this point is to forward it to council for recommendation to be approved. So. So you would like to? Well, well, I, I think I think there should be uh, I think there, there should be a little more detail in the, in the, uh, in the budget. Well, if, if, if the desire is to have GPC consider the aspects of the budget and the heritage designation and things like that that have been raised, um, a more appropriate motion would be to forward it to GPC for consideration. Uh, do we want to just say the full report or, or, or comment on specific things such as the designation? I, I think it would be beneficial, as the committees have identified, to get a list of the various recommendations that are embedded in the report yes. so that it's summarized, yeah. and then we can comment on the budget and implementation considerations and bring that forward for as the body to report and then make our recommendations adoption based on your discussion. So um, it would be a summary basically of, of the uh, management plan, the proposed management plan, and then you can you know, comment on the various aspects of designation, the budget, and those kinds of things. I, I, would, I would like to have a little bit of an idea of the costs of designation. Um, I know as for our parks designation suggestion, most of the costs are staff time, the great, the vast majority of them, and then there's some cost for advertising, but the fact is that these processes take a lot of effort, and I would like to have some estimate of that, uh, given when we're discussing that. Uh, we can, we, we'll bring it forward in that form. appropriate to raise it here, but we, um, I think it might be beneficial just to have a short discussion around the motion on the Beacon Hill Transportation Plan. And um, the, as, as staff were, were looking at trying to now implement a motion that was brought forward by council uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago now, around an extension. Um, certainly we feel that there is some benefit in extending the, the um, the trial period, um, we would certainly see us putting it forward to about the end of uh, August next year so that we get a full year's worth of information and feedback and see how it is, uh, how it's impacted, uh, particularly through the heavy spring and summer months and, and how uh, pedestrians and, and car traffic uh, integrate at that stage. So if it is a benefit to the committee, we would make uh, bring or send a memo, I guess, or information forward to council, um, uh, saying suggesting that we would uh, run the trial period to August 30, 30, 31st next year, 
and um, that we would then report out to Council those findings by October of 2013. Does that sound reasonable? I think we're just trying to put some parameters around it and, and make some sense. Uh, yeah, no, I think, I think we need a little more time for the public to, number one, get visit the park and see what it means. Preferably both as pedestrians and as drivers, and also to uh, adapt to the, to the changes. You do that in kind of motion or statement comment, or do you just find with us? I, I just I, know, letting us know that. I think, I think yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll send it to, through to Council as a memo. If there's okay. any further information required, I can respond. So um, before we adjourn, I, I actually have a question. Because of the first report of the second part, and of course it goes back to dogs, and because of some emails that I've received uh, recently regarding uh, off-leash areas for dogs or even dog parks, um, I think we're finding as we have more residents in the downtown, they're looking for uh, places to take their dogs. And of course, it was, as it was mentioned, in the, in the report uh, that we just had, there are very little green spaces, uh, sort of the downtown core dogs. So I know on our parks plan, we're always looking, we have a list of parks that we uh, move to each, each, you know, I guess now it's uh, the Beacon uh, Match Plan, or next we'll be doing the Cook Street Playground, and the next we're doing. So where does the discussion ever come when we start to say, we need to add something? So uh, we need to look at an area. So if I'm looking at dog areas, and you know whether Topaz Park, uh, which is already a off leash area, whether we, you know, <coughs> funds could go to make actually an enclosed dog park. Or I know residents in Harris Green are saying on the boulevard, is there an opportunity to make a, a fenced area for people that live in that area into a, a dog park? So I just wanted to know how did we. Uh, Council has that discussion in the whole whole discussion of, uh, of parks. So it's probably been four years now since the dog uh, the dog program group was meeting on a regular basis. I think we felt like we had reached the end of the the process. And uh, um, in, in fact, one of the things we we know is that per capita we had something like the highest number of dog off leash areas of any municipality. Uh, that we could find, and, and that came through the master plan process. But at some point, and, and one of the things you and I talked about earlier this month was that our next formal management plan process, like Pioneer Square, is the Dallas Road waterfront area for next year, which we will be getting work on on this winter. And obviously, the dog uh, dog's use of that area is going to be a key issue that comes forward as part of that discussion with the community. So what we're doing now is kind of tackling them on a kind of a project by project basis. But at some point, you may want us to look at the whole dog off leash program and whether you know it needs to uh, be reviewed and and uh, as part of our work program. So it's not on our work program to do that at this point. But that's certainly something that could come through council strategic planning process, for example, and we can identify as a as a key priority, we would then put it on our work program. We, and we probably put a bit of a process in place, a review process in place, much like we had with a kind of a time frame and so forth. And you know, one of the unique things that we don't have that a lot of other municipalities are moving to are the fence dog, uh, dog park uh, uh, compound areas that you're seeing more and more, across, particularly on Vancouver Island and a number of other communities. So we may want to you know, look at new innovation, I guess, around dog, dogs in parks, and you know, look at the demographics that you're mentioning about how we're denser downtown, and people are looking for those areas in the downtown core. So, so certainly we'd be open to that. But the way we're handling it now is on a kind of a project by project, park by park basis. Yeah. And, and I appreciate that. I know uh, Councillor Coleman's at the back, and he, he and I both were the council liaisons for the dogs and parks, and. Uh, and I appreciate that we're going to be looking at the Dallas Road area um, because there is a large uh, uh, dog people um, area. But I think we found with the dogs and park by uh, opening up more areas uh, through the city of Victoria, uh, sometimes it would take the pressure off of the Dallas Road because people will be able to recreate their dog closer to their home instead of saying that's the only sort of closest area for me uh, to be off leash. 
And, and you're right, you know, in New York, I went and looked at the dog park there, right in the you know, middle of it, or, you know, in an urban setting. Um, I, I go to the Nanaimo one quite often just to check it out, to see how it's working. Uh, so, of course, there are, you know, always going to be some negative encounters uh, that, that happen, and usually it's about responsible dog ownership than anything else, but I'd love for us to be able to start to look at some new ways and whether the committee needs to be uh, reconvene just to see if there's even a couple more we can add to the, as the population starts to grow and uh, especially when we have more downtown. I think the person that emailed me said in their residence alone, they had like uh, 15 dogs and they don't have an area that they can be off leash uh, around their neighborhood uh, because they were like, in the Harris Green area. Mm -hmm. so. so is this, I, I may interject, uh, Harris Green is looking for green waste projects, it's one of our green waste projects next year to look at, so it might be an appropriate time to and I think some of the other planning initiatives, such as the review of the downtown core area plan, um, will start to identify opportunities for those kinds of, of initiatives. So th there's a lot of opportunities, I think, to start to address some of the concerns being expressed uh, through both staff and council uh, related to you know, things they would like to have happen in their communities. Thank you for indulging me in the time for doggy stuff. My, my apologies for being late because I did have a four-legged uh, problem this morning. Well, that's so. good because <laughs> Michaela's in the hospital, so what? We'll oh, yeah. Uh, motion to adjourn? Okay. All those in favor? Oh, okay.